Uh, it is Wednesday. I was hoping it was Friday, but new. No. It's Wednesday, March 7th, 2018. You know, this, is, this is your daily Forex trading strategy session. Let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance quarter of that is not necessarily indicative of future results. Please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. If you're attending this live, you're here at Forex.today. Thank you so much for uh, being here and posting your trade plans and sharing feedback with each other. It's good to see you every day at Forex.today. You might be also watching it on YouTube. If that's the case, uh, give it a like. That's helpful. Also, subscribe, because if you subscribe, what happens is when I run a, lo a live stream on YouTube, you're notified. So that just makes sense, right? Anyways, my name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for Traders Way. The charts that we will be using will be Traders Way charts, MT4 charts, powered by Traders Way. Today we're going to cover technical and fundamental analysis, maybe even some trader psychology. Uh, you know, fundamentals we got to talk about uh, once again, risk on, risk off for global macro. Uh, but I'm charged with the duty of helping you become a success sooner than later. My goal isn't to get you to trade more, uh, which is probably the goal of every other broker in the world, to simply get you to trade more. Um, Trader's Way is different. They want you to succeed because they're looking at this on the long term. If you survive and then thrive, it's just a better business model than churn and burn. Survive and thrive. At tradersway.com. Give us an opportunity to earn your loyalty and respect. Go to tradersway.com and open up a, a demo account at least. This Friday, I'm over at uh, FX Street where I'll be trading non farm payrolls live for the 143rd month in a row. Manny says, Can you please explain risk on, risk off? Yeah, you know what? Yes, Manny. Yes, I will. Let's go to the charts. Uh, can you ask me a little bit later? Oh yeah, you don't you don't Google. You ask Uncle Wayne. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I'm not going to answer it right this second, Manny. If you don't mind, I'd like to go through some of the charts and stuff. But please ask me five, ten times if you have to. But I. We'll get to it today, okay? Well, you know what? No, let's just do it now. Let's just do it now. All right, we'll do this now. All right, so first of all, risk on, risk off. Uh, watch yesterday's video. It's on YouTube. Uh, we talked somewhat about it. What what did we talk about? Um, no, it might have been two days ago we talked about risk on and risk off. Uh, so that was Monday. I think Monday's video then. Yeah, we must have talked about the 10-year T-note, right? Whenever that was. Was that yesterday? So we might have done it Monday and Tuesday. We'll do it today, though. But it's this idea uh, of macroeconomics uh, where risk on or risk off, we're looking at it for the whole aggregate, the, the whole market. In this case, the market is the global market. Okay? And the one thing that's unique about one special currency is that the whole entire world uses it for business and that is the u.s dollar the reserve currency okay so it has it, it's special it really is it, it's special and unique and therefore when business is good um one thing happens right and then when business is bad another thing happens that's the whole risk on risk off see Return is a function of risk. And if you're confident in, um, if you're just confident in general, you're willing to accept more risk, right? Self FSC, is that the root, right? Anyways, it's, if you're confident, then you're willing to take more risk. And if you take more risk, you have the opportunity to make more reward, right? So if you're confident in 
the in future expectations for business, right? If you think today and tomorrow and next week and next year are going to be great, you're willing to take on a little more risk because you're confident because you're searching for higher reward. Now, when you lose confidence, then you're like, whoa, I think we're going to lose money. And if that's the case, you don't want risk, right? You're like, no, 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 no. I think things are bad. Give me my risk back, right? <laughs> Which means you're not making investments. What is a risk? Well, um, how about putting down a million dollars on a house for 30 years? Okay. The risk is over 30 years. What if it loses value? It's possible. People have done it, right? Especially in California, you pay a million dollars for a doghouse. So the risk is over the course of 30 years, something could happen. And at the very least, it may not have been the best investment you could have done with your money. But at the worst case, it could lose. You can lose money in the real estate market, right? So imagine when, um, if the real estate market was weak, what if, what if real estate prices haven't changed in five years? It may not be a good opportunity to invest. So you say, well, I'm not going to put my money in the market. I'm going to keep it in cash, right? And you do something else with your money. So that's kind of the risk on risk off. When, when you feel confident now and for future expectations, you, you're willing to invest your money, which is risk in seek of a higher reward and you're like well i'm okay with the risk because i'm not really worried about it i think we're fine my so i'm going to put it to work okay now when you put it to work that will weaken the dollar and i explained that uh with the tenure t note i think it was yesterday like for 20 minutes okay and when we say risk off they're saying, look, we're not confident in the near future, and we don't want risk. We want our money back. So they want to get out. So you sell your house because you think it's going to lose value, right? So you sell your house, and now you have a bunch of cash in your bank account. Well, what that does is increase demand for safe haven. And that globally, because of the reserve currency issue we talked about, will be something like a U.S. government treasury. Because the U.S. government is, uh, you know, manages the largest economy in the world, so it should be safer than everything else. If, uh, if there's not enough money to cover your debt, then the United States can raise taxes, or at the very least, they can just print more money. But you're going to get your money back one way or the other, right? And somewhere in between, they could just bomb a third world country and take their, their stuff, right? So anyways, you, so, the, so what that will do is when things are bad globally, remember it's globally now, um, a foreign investor could say, I want to buy a US government treasury because it's the closest thing to cash that pays me a, 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 an interest rate, whatever, right? So you buy a treasury, which means that increases demand for treasuries, which increases prices. And to buy these things, you need U.S. dollars. So that increases demand for U.S. dollars. So when things are bad, the U.S. dollar performs well. When things are good, those foreigners take all their money out of treasuries, sell all the treasuries, sell all their US dollars and buy currencies and for other investments around the world. So this is where you, even the media mixes all this stuff up where they're, they're, they think the, the weak US dollar is bad. And I never understood that because it's just not true. When things are good, the US dollar is weak. And they're weak because Americans are filthy, stinking rich. And their money enters the global market because they'll hire someone to work way less than them. Right? Uh, 
Uh, somewhat, James. Uh, somewhat. The you know, the yen is is also unique, right? It's not a reserve currency, though, is it? Right. Well, and it's confusing. So, yeah, my position for the U.S. dollar has to do with not even the U.S. economy, every all the other economies, right? Um, but it it for some reason it's counter to what I, I I hear like from experts and stuff, and I never quite get it. And I get frustrated actually, even with my wife, I get frustrated where I'll say things like, "I don't understand why other people don't understand." Right? It was frustrating to go from an amateur to an expert, and then you walk in through into the room full of experts, and you're like, "These guys aren't experts at all." And it's kind of a letdown. Right? It sucks to walk into the room of Illuminati and have to turn the light on. What are you guys doing sitting in the dark? Uh, what? <laughs> Jesuit free. I don't even know what that means, but it's funny. But hurtful, man. That's hurtful. Come on, great. That's just hurtful and unnecessary. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that there's your risk on risk off. Great. Move on. Get out of it. All right. Uh, oh, so this is the, the reason I wanted, uh, I decided to answer the question is I wanted to also talk about cone. All right. Uh, Gary Cohn quit yesterday, so you have to go back to what we talked about on Monday. I guess it was Monday or maybe Friday. Um, Trump is announced that he wants to protect the steel and aluminum industry to punish China, which actually doesn't make any sense, right? Because that won't hurt them in the slightest. But we talked about it like, hey, that's interesting because the Chinese had an envoy on their way and. And the timing of that is amazing. And, and even though everyone's freaking out that he's actually going to impose trade barriers, I said, well, maybe it's actually a ploy to start the negotiation. Maybe it's a revolver on the boardroom table in front of Trump. And I said, just maybe if playing his cards right, he's a genius. Right? Because if he's opening... Uh, to avoid a, a defect effect kind of situation, um, it, it's the right play on game theory and all this kind of stuff. So I said, look, you might not get it, and, and it may sound bad and all that, but it, he might actually be a genius if that's his intent. Um, Gary Cohn, who used to be, what, uh, executive vice president of Goldman Sachs, um, quit. Barry says uh, you thought Trump fired him. It's sort of the same thing, right? You let someone quit to save face kind of thing. But their argument clearly would have been over um, protectionism versus free markets. Goldman Sachs people are free market people. Um, and he's out of the White House now. That doesn't bode well for the whole maybe he's a genius idea. <laughs> Maybe Trump's a genius idea. Oh, well, um, that's not good. So anyways, you might want to look at what happened Monday in the, in whatever market you're following, stock market or your, you know, or this. And then um, to go back to the day it was announced um, that Trump might uh, initiate um, trade barriers. And then... That, whatever happened then is happening now, that is back on the table with Gary Cohn leaving. It looks pretty like pretty serious, like he, he's going to uh, jack up um, tariffs on steel and aluminum and almost certainly going to do it on other things now. And um, that probably will be a risk off. And why is that a risk off? Is that a political opinion? Am I just against Trump or something? No, it's bad for, it's bad for business. Also, 
if you have studied economics and you've done economic models, um, you know that if you increase trade barriers, you increase inflation. And it goes back to this idea that I just said earlier. If I'm filthy, stinking rich, why would I clean my own toilets? I can just get some other person to do it for a lot less because it's not that I don't want to do it or I can't do it or I don't like doing it. It's just like I'm over here making $20 million a, a month. I don't have uh, – it'd be expensive for me to clean my own toilets, right? I'm like I make $40 million, I make four, uh, $400,000 an hour. Why would I spend an hour of my time cleaning bathrooms, right, when I can hire someone else for 10 bucks? You get it? So you're like, it just makes more sense. If I do this job over here, I make $400,000 an hour. If I go clean my toilets, I don't make $400,000. I get a clean toilet. So I say, well, why don't I just work over here, work 400, make $400,000? That's rich, right? I'm making $400,000 an hour over here. So I'll just do one hour's worth of work, and uh, I... I can pay someone 10 bucks to clean my toilets, right? Like, pretty obvious, right? So, what if I can't hire someone for 10 bucks an hour to clean my toilet? Well, now I got to pay, essentially, like, if I'm, if I'm my own country now, now I have to pay $400,000 to clean toilets, right? So, the prices of toilet cleaning have gone up from 10 bucks to $400,000. You see what I mean? Inflation is going to go up in the United States. Put it, put it the other, so let's explain it again in, in, a, in a very, very simple term. With access to workers globally, I can find someone to work cheap, right? Cheaper than me. Whether it's cleaning toilets, mowing the lawn, but it could be uh, working on the website or something, right? There are, there, there are in places in the world expensive workers, and then in places in the world there are less expensive workers. And when there's no barriers to trade at all, money will just flow to uh, the cheapest value really right you don't want bad worker you you want cheap right so you, you you will have access everywhere and that lowers inflation right right i could hire a guy in the silicon valley to program uh java for me and pay him 200 dollars an hour or i can get some guy in pakistan the same credentials to program for $20 an hour. If I can just access the guy in Pakistan with no problems at all, boom, then, then now my cost of Java programming is lower. Prices are lower. Inflation is lower, right? So if you take away workers outside the Silicon Valley, and all I can do is hire people in Palo Alto or San Francisco, and they're like, whoa, look, you know, you got to pay me a lot because it's expensive to live here. Everyone's rich, and you know, my apartment is super expensive, and I pay five hundred dollars a month for parking my car, right? So you got to pay me two hundred bucks an hour, bro. Plus stock options, plus health benefits, plus plus plus, plus free soda, right? And you're like, dude, this is expensive. So that's anyways long. Didn't mean to make it that long, but you put up trade barriers, you get inflation. Chuck says higher inflation means higher interest rates, which means higher USD. Yeah. You put it that way. It's convoluted though, isn't it? But the thing is, we don't know what the foreigners are going to do and stuff. So uh, I would say less trade. Well, of course, oversimplified, but you, you know, that is the world. But um, all economics is oversimpl uh, oversimplified, right? Because you're going to hold something constant because there's too many variables. 
But I think it's more like less trade is, is bad for business. Less, less uh, access to a global market will mean higher prices. Higher prices may, is, a, is the definition of higher inflation. Um, the Fed may have to raise interest rates more, but it doesn't force foreigners to, let's say, buy the USD because of the higher interest rate, which I think you're saying. Um, uh, so uh, you, we got to be careful now because now we're mixing sort of um, free market model with a closed market model or a hybrid in there. And I'm just not entirely sure that the U.S. dollar will maintain that role of safe haven. If, if we don't have open borders. So what if, what if we get a situation where you have high prices, you have high interest rates, and a weak dollar? Oh, 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 oh. oh that would be bad. I mean, that would be like train wreck bad. Okay, so let's hope that, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Well, no, then uh, maybe China decides to do its business with Europe. Okay, so anyways, going back to this, we're at that point where it's elevated enough to be a concern. This whole area here on Monday was the projected top. So if you recall, on Monday you had two choices. As a bear, you would have sold here and targeted this. And as a bull, you would have bought here and targeted that. Conservative target is reached, although we're really supposed to head up here this week. But that, you know, doesn't have to. But that's what the, the, our model our, for swing trading would have predicted. Because of that low, you would think R2, but, you know, don't be stubborn either, right? Okay. You okay, but the the model it would suggest a little bit higher. Okay, so I'm just looking at this pink zone. Uh, so if you are a bear and it didn't work out for you on Monday, because you would have shorted here, you you might have made a little bit of money. More likely, you broke even. That's fine. Oh, that's fine. You did your job. It's fine. It's also what happens when you trade in the middle. Of the range see if you bought it down here as a bull you're golden right and then uh, so as a bear now you might have taken here middle of the range not a great place to trade but I can I totally get it if, if this was your plan that was a great plan well played sir you lost money the so that's that's the good that's the way to lose money properly okay so it didn't break didn't trend fine so now you got an area in here what we call an AO an area of opportunity in this pink zone it's it's mediocre I think what would be more interesting is next week like Monday you get an opportunity to sell up here so I'm wondering if we kind of do this Because, you know, this is non-farm payroll, so maybe in here, we, we just before non-farm payrolls, we lose some um, liquidity, we lose the volatility. 
and then maybe uh, NFP comes out and uh, let's see, I'll use an arrow. Uh, uh, NFP comes out and we do sort of one of these things. Uh, James, the interesting thing about correlations is they can and they do change. So don't get caught up. It's not like um, a universal force of <clears throat> universal force of nature. So I don't know if you were talking about uh, our earlier conversation, like what if um, Trump closing the borders threatens the reserve status of our currency? Um, if that happens, then your, your normal sort of correlations like gold being the anti-dollar may or may not hold up because the, the, the way that the dollar is looked at globally as an asset or as a safe haven might change. Why would a country with closed borders be considered a global safe haven, <laughs> right? I mean, just by, just by definition, you're like, wouldn't a global reserve currency be from an economy that's open? I mean, think of it, when Malaysia sells oil to China or whatever, they do it in U.S. dollars. I guess it would be Malaysia doing business with Japan, right? But still. So anyways, uh, we got to be careful. Um, uh, when was the last time we did something like this? I'm sure it was a while, but like I said, ask uh, Honduras how things went when they closed their borders. We studied something years ago in economics where uh, I think it was Honduras and El Salvador. Um, uh, they, uh, there's a hot sauce that people used. I don't know if it's true. Um, okay, yeah, ADP. Let me get. Anyways, um, there was a hot sauce that people used. Just culturally, everyone kind of used this hot sauce in this region. And Honduras says, well, why should we be importing this stuff from El Salvador? We can just make our own. So the tariff, the other country, and start making it locally. Fast forward 20 years, <laughs> nobody's got hot sauce. Right? Think of all the lovely grocery stores and supermarkets in Cuba. And just firing up the news. So ADP, another dumb prediction. Survey where it's done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, however, is conducted by a payroll company. So this would be for companies that are not big enough to have their own HR department do this kind of work, you know, payroll and benefits, that would be cheaper to hire a company like ADP. So anyways, this is one sort of uh, measure of employment. Okay. 
Okay. So they're expecting 200,000. It was 234 prior. You know, we're, we really want to know about wages and stuff. The following numbers, I think, are just the fact that there are just less people available for work because everyone's already working. Um, if you want to be an academic about it, you want to look at the change in labor force participation rate between the, the not in workforce, right, not in labor force people and unemployed people. So unemployment may actually go up and that might be a good thing because the economy is so hot we're sucking other, the people out of the not in labor force. So the people that haven't worked in let's say six months. Oh, uh, did they come over already? No, we got five. Yeah, we'll see some trade data out of North America. We'll get so anyway, so we, we actually want to see unemployment go up a bit because we want to see an economy so strong that people are knocking on doors and say, hey man, put down the PlayStation 3 controller and come back to work, bro. We'll, we know you're not the most productive person on the planet um, but we're willing to pay you a salary anyways because we just need somebody to sit in the seat and do do a, a job uh, we'll pay you whatever you need but please come back to the labor force so we'll see okay but anyway, so uh, more jobs, good. Um, look, if we only add 200,000, you know, that, that's pretty good. But consider this more of a measure of smaller to medium-sized businesses. Right? Imagine uh, you're an entrepreneur, you have a company of 50 people. You probably don't have the sophisticated human resource department, or at least maybe you shouldn't when you could just hire this company or another one like it to do payroll and benefit administration all that kind of stuff for for much cheaper yeah one of my uh i think the very first high-tech startup i tried to create was to address a market like this I was I found my old business plan and stuff in um, pitch deck from a meeting with investors. And it was talking about using the collaborative te uh, technology of the internet. <laughs> like, like I had to explain it. Like you could use servers. Reminder, we're just a few minutes now from the ADP employment report. Look, imagine that. I mean, I was explaining to someone like time time cards, right? A consultant does shouldn't have to fill out a time card by hand and fax it. You could use the internet for that. So, anyways, that was my first company. And guess what it was called? I employ. This is before I everything. This is way Apple was going out of business. I mean, this was this was 1996. And I was designing an internet-based company for payroll administration, recruitment, benefits, using the internet. <laughs> Not bad, huh? Anyways, so ADP coming up. By the way, it was spelled like this, too. Oh, that's not it. Where's the chat? It was uh, spelled like this. I am with an exclamation all right any minute now get out of your own way I, I, I.
monthly resistance, weekly resistance. Waiting for ADP. Any second now. Isn't that funny, Eric? 1996. Might have been 1997. Because I got a bonus back then. All right, here we go. There for the ADP beating expectations. Two thirty five. Two thirty five. Basically the same as last month. The journey was revised higher by ten thousand for the ADP. It revised higher to two hundred and forty four thousand. Oh. That no one saw that coming, but that may small business saw growth to sixty-eight thousand. Natural resources and mining were up two thousand. Construction up twenty-one thousand. Manufacturing close fourteen thousand. We saw a decline in information jobs. Mark Zandi saying that the job market is red hot and threatens to overheat. Federal government spending increases and tax cuts. Growth is to accelerate. All right, so uh, I'd say that's pretty decent news. Um, the headline number was uh, on trend, same as last month. Uh, and then last month was revised up, and last month was good. I mean, again, 235, right? So yeah, Barry says chase, guys, chase, right? Yeah, this kind of goes just back to proper trade planning in general, right? So I think what Barry is saying is, look, if you had a basic trade plan, you know, you're, these are like buy zones for a bull. Maybe even, I don't even know. I mean, you maybe could have this one, right? And really, this is just now a sell zone. Does the news even really matter? Well, I suppose the news will matter if it changes things and, and it decides to head up and blow through these pivots. But would this be a good place to buy? If you wrote a book on how to trade uh, currencies using patience and discipline, would you say, you know, wait till you hit monthly and weekly resistance and buy at the 55? Right? So yeah, it doesn't change a lot here. If you were a bear, you'd be setting this up and taking shots and probably not very confident in the whole process. But um, there, there is something going on here, as you can see, right? So the thought process here is, would you agree that yesterday or Monday, you could have thought of this area here as a potential place to consider selling if you saw evidence uh, of at least profit taking from the bulls. Would that be a fair assumption if you did your job? That that might be a place you might see some red candles, right? Like you wouldn't have thought it here, you wouldn't have thought it here, and you wouldn't have thought it here, but this is like red hot, right? Cool. Then you say to yourself, well, if I see some evidence of, of, of at least profit taking there, um, I can set this up for a sell. So you could just simply sell up here, let's say a 5A cross, right? That's straight out of the textbook, isn't it? Take a shot with the 5A cross, okay? But super conservative traders will wait for the lower low and then set up the lower high and expect from there a new lower low, right? And we would call this the new sell zone. 
That's just price action. Super simple price action, right? And of course, if it's a risk off day, if the stock market falls, I wouldn't be surprised to see a strong dollar. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a strong dollar off of the weekly M4, monthly R1. I mean, like, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Like, that's where, in fact, you would assume it would happen, right? So that you would take that and put it into trade. Any questions about that? Uh, 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 oh. I think I'm going to be done my paper today on um, the minimum wage. Looking forward to that. Look at uh, 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 uh. Get out of your own way. La 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 la. With or without czar. All right. With the without czar, oh, oh. It's only Rand. All right. By the end of the month, well, let's let's do this differently. I don't want to say that. Let me do this differently. If you were bear on this pair, you would have sold it here. If you were a bull on this pair, you would have bought it here. Not because that's the top and bottom, but because that's where the key levels of support and resistance are. We knew that on the very first day of the month. You're a bear. This was an awesome place to sell, and you were just thrilled to have that opportunity. And if you're a bull, you're like, gee whiz, man. I want to buy it, but I don't want to buy it until we get down here to like 1170. Sure enough, you had to wait a week, and then it came down, and you're like, that's it. That's perfect. I am so thrilled to buy this here. And you would be done. As a bear, maybe you have an opportunity to sell it down here. And as a bull, maybe it does this or something. But there's not a lot to do now. Okay. Now, if you're using uh, price action, the, right, this bullish move is pretty impressive because it suggests this. Okay. And what does that say to me? Technically, it says the fundamentals. For that to happen, fundamentals would have to suck. Global macroeconomics would have to be under threat. The dollar would have to be strong, but at the same time, Rand would have to be weak. Well, boy, that could be Trump threatening to close the borders of the United States and threatening global trade, right? Jonathan, studies have shown, and like a lot of research, and I think it's the, um, the uh, CBO, 
the Congressional Budget Office study, says that there will be job loss. Some people will lose their jobs. Some people will retain their jobs at the higher wage. Some of those jobs will have less quality because to pay for the higher prices, employers may offer less fringe benefits. So like Tim Hortons in Canada had a similar situation. And what they did is just stop paying people um, for coffee breaks. They used to actually pay their employees during their work. They're like, sit down, take a 15 minute break, but you know, you'll be compensated. Don't worry about it. Well, now they don't compensate, right? So that's a fringe benefit. And imagine that in your office, you used to have awesome coffee during your coffee break, but then the employers are like, well, I'm forced to pay you more. So to, to help compensate for that higher cost, I'm buying cheap coffee for the office now. We used to get expensive, high quality, but I found a way to save 50 cents. <laughs> right? I found a way to save 50 cents. And now the coffee sucks and stains your teeth yellow. But I save 50 cents. So congratulations on your higher wage, right? Um, or uh, what Walmart did in January, they announced they, they're um, laying off 3,500 um, um, store managers, but they're hiring half of them back as assistant managers. They call that wage compression. So long story short, uh, Jonathan, increased minimum wage will some people will make more money. Some people will lose their job. The quality of the work may change. Um, however, uh, 900,000 people, uh, if the minimum wage is 1010, will be raised from at or below the poverty line to above the poverty line. 19% of this increased wages will go to people at the poverty line. The problem is 29% of the higher uh, income will go to families that are 300% above the minimum uh, poverty line, right? Which I think it is actually kind of better for them anyways, right? So those that are making above minimum wage, but the, you know, it's still expensive to live in the United States. Even if you're making uh, you know, triple the minimum wage, you know, to raise kids and stuff is still a, a difficult proposition. <laughs> and healthcare and all this kind of stuff, it's still expensive. So maybe it's better off. So it's funny, the majority of the money will go to people that are three times higher than minimum wage, but they're still poor, right? So I'm thinking, well, uh, maybe that's better anyways. Uh, so only 19% to go to people that are at the poverty line or lower. So it really depends on whether you want minimum wage to uh, affect poverty. Now, the funny thing about writing laws, so I, I'm actually, I've read a recent bill that proposes an increase in minimum wage and indexing it. Um, so I'm reading this, um, this bill, and when you write a law, it doesn't say, well, the point of this law is, right? It doesn't say that. So I don't know if the intent is to actually improve the poverty level or reduce poverty. I don't know if that's the goal. What if it's simply to put more money in, in poor people's pockets so that they go out and spend it on, you know, uh, uh, cigarettes, beer, diapers, and uh, long stick on fingernails and uh, uh, getting your hair done at the beauty parlor? That's good for business. That makes rich people rich. Poor people spend their money. Rich people have so much disposable income, there's, they already have everything, so they don't spend any money. They invest, right? So anyway, so I, that could be the intent, just to like, hey, give a whole bunch of poor people more cash, they're going to go out and spend it. And you know at the end of the month, if you gave them an extra $300, that $300 is gone. They'll just spend it, which is good for rich people because they own the convenience store. They're, they own the beauty parlor. They own stock in the company that owns all of that, right? It's good. So I don't know what the intent is, and that's part of my paper. Like, I don't know what this is supposed to do. Who are we supposed to help?
And what does that do? So 900,000 people are raised above the poverty line. That's really good. But what about the people that actually lose their job and now they're worse off? Where do they go? They show up to the government. They're like, give me some money. Give me some food. Give me some shelter. Give it to me. And all of a sudden, now i got to pay for this guy, even though that guy's better off. India has it like this. You don't work, you starve. You starve, yeah, we just dump your body in the river. Not a problem. You're hungry, work. I don't have money for a house. Go live by the railroad tracks. Build a little house three inches away from where the train goes by. You'll be fine. Figure it out. You don't like that? Get a job. Anyways, I can't put that in the paper, though. <laughs> I can't put Harvard doesn't like that stuff. Well, you know, and I've said this before, so now I'm watching Euro try here. That's interesting. Peso. Peso rallied back, huh? whoever stayed short. Remember, I got knocked out in here. Someone had the opportunity, boom. Uh, I forget who it was, but someone did stay in the trade. Uh, remember, I, sh I shorted here on Friday, and I got knocked out here on Monday. Someone stayed short. But imagine this. This is the line where you, th you know, I, I was just, just underneath this line, right? So anyways, uh, let me change the color. I was actually short here if you remember okay so I still would have been broken up but someone stayed short but this is the line where you would assume if you were going to short that's the area you were going to short funny thing is this is the line if you were going to buy and I would never buy this pair but if you were going to buy that is the exact line that you would want to buy it so I don't know if you guys want to do this but that's not the repatriation trade that I, I like to do <clears throat> so all bets are off. Um, uh, the the Trump issue, does, uh, the closed borders issue with aluminum steel, that shouldn't impact peso at all. Uh, it'll impact the Canadian dollar more than them. Um, Kitty says next month. It, yeah, for me, it's always next month. You take the shot, uh, remove the risk, hope for the best. Uh, to me, it's just a, another opportunity, right? But uh, interesting, nonetheless, technical analysis certainly working here, right? If you're a swing trader, you're looking at that. That is so straight up, straightforward. Uh, it's encouraging because it's it's maybe a currency pair that's not looked at as much, right? I mean, you could say, yeah, well, if you don't use technical analysis trading the euro dollar, you're you're off the clue train, right? But like, who trades USD Mexican peso besides the Mexican government? Like, Okay. Right, but whoever's trading it uses pivot points. That's the part I like, and I say, "Whew!" At least I can trade that, right? I don't know much, but I know I love you. Okay. Uh, 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 gold, gold hasn't changed at all. Okay, you should already know we have a bottom down here, we have a top up here. Okay, if you are a bear and you are aggressive, then you see all of that, and you know we're stuck in the range, but you're so aggressive, you say, Well, there's one price I would sell this. It's that price right there. <clears throat> Let's zoom in. Do, do, do. Drop into a smaller chart. Do, do, do. And you said, and you would have known this on Monday as well, uh, you would sell it at $13.39 and 54 cents. Isn't that funny? 
like on Monday, it's Wednesday now, right? On Monday, you're like, well, if I were going to sell it, I wouldn't sell it here. 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 But this looks good. And you did that three days ago. <clears throat> Wait, <laughs> I can't even draw the arrow. Isn't that cool, though? <clears throat> With that in mind, do you believe market participants use pivot points when trading gold? Sorry, gold futures. Chuck says yes. Yeah. Lester and Martin, yes, yes. Craig, Daniel, Daniel, Craig, Artem. Yeah, everyone's yes. Gary, yes. So here's the interesting thing, Napoleon, yes, many is. Here's the interesting thing. Do you remember when you didn't know how to trade pivot points? Like, right? Like, I'm telling you, you should name your children after me for sharing this valuable piece of information with you. Right? You're like, Leslie, we're going to legally change your name now. Yes, Papa. Leslie, uh, your new name is Wayne. <gasps> okay, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get enough sleep. <laughs> Anyways, I don't get enough sleep. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> that'd be a great name for dogs, right? I used to like this uh, when, uh, do, you guys, do you guys remember um, Higgins on Robin Master's estate? He'd come out in the morning and he'd say to his two Doberman pinchers, Zeus, Apollo, and the dogs would sit up straight, patrol, and the two dogs would go in opposite directions and run around the whole property and inspect the property and come right back and then sit at attention, right? Wouldn't it be great you walk out to your beautiful Hawaiian paradise property of yours and your dogs follow you out and you're like, support, resistance, <laughs> patrol. Empty, <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> oh, did I miss a question? Uh, Katie's question. I was going to end it, but then I think it looks like Katie might have asked a question. All right, Katie, all yen pairs, they are starting to go up, but they should do that now. Wow, 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 wow. Don't say it that way, Katie. Don't say that they should go up. No, they don't have to do anything. What I said on Monday, you have to go back to this. I said, we can assume over the next six weeks, that the yen pairs could go start going up. We don't know when. I said even that day. It could start today. We don't know. But it's our job now to use technical analysis to confirm or deny our hypotheses. So an example is the hypotheses may be built on Japanese yen repatriation because of fiscal year end of, uh, for their corporations. But then I also said 
do you think a Japanese CFO would wait until the last day to repatriate money or would this professional <laughs> do it ahead of time? And I'm like, well, probably ahead of time, right? Like all that kind of stuff. So if you think we found bottom or not even that, you, you have an opportunity, you could take the shot. For example, Ozzy Yen, this is the pivot that says up. On USD Yen, this is the pivot that says up. Okay? On Euro Yen, this is the pivot that says up. On the monthly pivots, <clears throat> I said that on Monday, right? Three candles ago, which is when we were on that pivot. When we were on the pivot, when we were on the pivot. So I already told you. I already set it up when we were actually at the buying opportunity. The thing is, like, I don't know if it's the buying opportunity. So that's why I had the conversation or discussion with everyone that, right, if you thought it would go up and you think it could go up between now and the next six weeks, Maybe this is opportunity. Everything says down, but we're at a buy zone. Look at the CAD yen. This is the pivot that says up. Right? Every single one of them. This on the Kiwi is the monthly buying pivot. Right? So I don't know if they're going to go up. But don't say they're supposed to go up in two weeks and you can't buy them now. No, 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 no. You. They don't have to do anything. They'll go up whenever they want to go up. Whenever the whole market is done doing whatever they've been doing. And it's not a day. It's not a moment. It's not an event-driven strategy. It's fundamental. <clears throat> John, if you don't know how to use pivot points, go to FX Boot Camp. Uh, and pay to money to take the swing trading course. Funny thing about Forex is you need money. But, okay. So anyways, um, that's why we use technical analysis now. It's to confirm or deny technically your fundamental hypotheses for the near future. Okay? And you have every right to say that could be the bottom of the market for the month of March because we believe by the middle of April these will be up anyways. Is that the left leg of a double bottom? I don't know. Okay. But I did tell you there would probably be a false rally. I don't know if you even want to call it false. But uh, these should, I would, I would hypothesize. I would prophesize because I'm a prophet of profit. My prophecy is that these yen pairs will rally until the, the middle of June. And it'll start in the next six weeks or Monday, like I said. The profit of profit. Okay? So the rest is up to you. Do you want to, like, the last time we were in this situation, we predicted the end pairs would, would fall. 
they all fell roughly a thousand pips each. And you missed it. Can I explain why? No. <laughs> How about this, Artem? Can you explain why not? No. It's not begging. It's like, well, you probably can't explain why not, so maybe I can't explain why. Why does it even matter? Right? How about because, because it could, because it can. It's your hypotheses. I don't care what the hypothesis is. <laughs> Rin's like, Wayne actually said April, May, and half of June it would rally. Yeah, okay. But the, the thing is, the whole point is the hypothesization of your trading. It's called a plan. It's called a bias. So, Artem, you, you could say your hypothesis is that the yen pairs fall until the middle of June. I bet you you'll do a bet. You'll you'll do better as a trader because you have the hypotheses. Okay? Because then you're looking for setups, you're looking for resistance, you're looking for pullbacks, you're avoiding other things. You're obviously being patient and disciplined to look to look for the proper setups because you believe it's going to fall. And if it rallies, you just probably won't be trading a lot over the next three months. There will be times in the rally where it dips. You, you, you make enough money to pay for the day, right? You, you, you have uh, small wins and small losses, and the next three months are not great. But you're not going to like, lose a ton of money. And in that case, I'd probably do quite well. And the only difference is in, it's not the patience and discipline. It's not necessarily skill. I don't think my technical analysis is any better than a lot of people here, right? Because at some point, good enough is good enough. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to trade currencies, right? If you're a bull, you'll, you'll do fine when the market's bullish, and you won't do fine when the market's not bullish, right? So it's just whatever. So in that case, I'll probably do pretty well. And then it'll probably come back down and then consolidate. And the thing is, you have to have a plan, you have to have a bias, and, you, and if you get good at matching them to what actually occurs, you'll do all right. You'll, you'll be fine. So I already know what I'm going to do in, in middle of, or let's say the end of June in July. My trading will, will, behavior will change. But I already know. I already have some basic assumptions and stuff. So again, why... Can I explain why the, the yen pairs would rally in the next six weeks and continue to do so to the middle of June? No, it's just a hypothesis. And, and so our attempt says, no, I think it'll be consolidate now and then rally the third week of June. I'm actually changing my tone. I'll say it'll rally now, then come back, consolidate, and rally in the third week of September. So you're like, you're doing my last year's trade and the year before trade, but I'm adjusting already. So now maybe maybe not third week of August, maybe third week of September. The thing is, that's it's they're just hypotheses. They're a way to tune our human mind. See, our human mind works to see patterns. Because you're like, whoa, what was that thing walking through the grass over there on the savanna? It had... It had stripes. Was it a zebra or was it a tiger? Hmm. I don't know. It could be danger or it could be opportunity, right? So there's you see patterns, but you end up seeing all kinds of patterns that may not even really exist. It's called confirmation bias. Or as Frederick Nietzsche calls it, you know, says, you know, perception creates reality. Right? So we need to focus, otherwise you get this situation where you say, well, your inability to trade profitably is because you, you have a difficult time making decisions, but you're not quite sure. Think about that. So now we have to train our mind to say, 
I have a decision made. And it doesn't matter if you get to the decision by flipping a coin. All right, for the next three months, I'm a bull. doesn't matter, but you have a decision made, and now you look at your charts and you say, I can confirm or deny the setup. It's either bullish or it's not bullish. It's either bearish or not bearish. And if you get rid of all the other noise, your trading will improve. I bet you most of you guys, if we just got rid of the mediocre trades, right, just your mediocre trades, you're probably quite profitable. Think about that. You're in your own way. And this is one step to get rid of the mediocrity because then you either have a loss because you were wrong or you have a win because you were right. And I bet you you're smart enough and you're good enough and you're experienced enough and you're talented enough and you're skilled enough that most of the time you're probably right. So what's holding you back is all this stuff in the middle where you make some money and then you give some back and you make some money, you give some back. And then you're wrong, and then you make some money, and then you give some back. I bet you I can fix that. Well, actually, I know I can fix that. Self efficacy? Efficacy? Self efficacy? Confidence? Self confidence? Whatever. So, anyways, yeah. Yeah, I got it, Pete. I haven't. Dude, Pete, I. Uh, you know, I go to bed at like after midnight, I wake up like at five, and the first thing I'm, I'm doing is I'm on the phone. Uh, I've communicated with people in multiple countries already this morning. Like, uh, I just, but but the idea though is uh, um, the fact you're doing it is enough. Whether it's right or wrong, I'm who's to say? You know what I mean? Who's to say? It doesn't to me. It doesn't matter. But the fact that you're doing it. So Pete, if you, I hope you don't mind, Pete actually took out PowerPoint slot, a PowerPoint deck. I went through all the currencies, made decisions, <clears throat> wrote down um, the evidence of why Pete's a bull or a bear, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't need to review it. The fact that you did it. Is enough. Now, the next step then, Pete, is you have to actively implement it. And that's where I think um, uh, the fund that we're launching, uh, I'm taking care of some technical stuff on the, of the site. So, for example, the people that are trading in my fund with me, they're going to be able to chat with them each other in real time and, and track their own performance in real time and do some other really neat stuff um, as a community, but it'll be very closed doors because no one wants to see their no one wants their laundry public. But I think it would help uh, to have that uh, as a private community. So, anyways, uh, spending money doing that, but whatever. Uh, so, right on, man. You're going in the right direction, Pete. So, uh, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. Hope you like my hat. You like my new hat? All right. Is it too much? Is it too much? Huh? Is it too much? I look like a, a Harvard freak, right? I look like a tourist. <laughs> no, it's not my chair. It's uh, the desk. It's just holding the laptop. My real desk is behind me, obviously. So, it, yeah. Oh, no, it's gangsta. I, <laughs> bro. Actually, uh, an African-American woman came up to me one time. Or I, I'm dressed with the matching shoes and stuff. And she came up and she just flat out gave me a compliment. Like, you know, she didn't say it quite as directly, but she basically said, that's pretty fly for a white guy. Like, no joke. And it was totally funny. Like, she, I'm like, I'm trying. I'm trying. 
<laughs> but it was totally funny because you knew actually what she was saying. And I don't know, maybe it's double racist, you know, I, I, I don't know. But it was pretty funny because it was just funny. It was totally funny. <laughs> Yeah, and the funny thing about Georgia is they think I'm 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 cheering for Alabama. They don't think Harvard, so I get away with it. They're like, oh, he's he's an Alabama Alabama fan, Rolling Tide, Crimson Tide, baby. Like, uh, oh, no, just Crimson. But anyways, because there's so many Harvard people in in Georgia, right? So anyways, I'll see you uh, tomorrow. Yeah, it does, right? I mean, it totally does, right? <laughs> oh, Georgia Matt, yeah, dog. <laughs> so there, one of my uh, daughter's um, uh, mom's, uh, one of my daughter's friend's mom came over to pick her up, and we were talking about stuff. And I said, yeah, you know, Wynn's going to Harvard. And my, my wife said, well, what if she doesn't go to Harvard? What if she goes to UGA? And, I, and so I say to this mom, I'm reacting at my, and I say to my wife, there's no way she's going to go to UGA. Never in a million years. She's like, what? <laughs> well, my, my son is going to UGA. That's his first choice. <laughs> You can start fights around here, <clears throat> but I gave the same story. I flew uh, flew for dinner. I, went, I flew down to Florida to meet the billionaire, uh, and then got on the plane back on the way back. And I gave the same speech. I'm like, "There's no way my kids are going to UGA." <laughs> no, actually, I'm going to be in Athens in like two three weeks. My kids are doing a Duke tip program for geniuses, uh, so they'll be at UGA. But anyway, so I give the same, and I, I'm sitting in first class. There's a dude next to me, and he, we're talking about kids and stuff. And I give the story. I'm like, there's no way my kids are going to go to UGA. I'd rather die, right? I'm just being facetious, right? Because I love picking on people, especially in Georgia, because everybody loves Georgia. So anyways, and, he's, and he sits up, and he's like, I was a quarterback for Georgia Tech. I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, I'm on my way to Georgia Tech right now. I'm sponsoring a, a huge, um, uh, basically he's donating so much money to Georgia Tech. They're throwing a whole dinner and a whole, a whole get together. Hundreds of people are going. He's paying for like uh, football players to go through the program because he was a football player. So he's actually paying their tuition and stuff. And he's like, oh, man, you're the greatest guy. He's like, you got to give me your card. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I love Georgia Tech. I sit on a board at Georgia Tech. I've actually taught at the, the executive MBA program in their business school. And he's like, no way. you got to call me up. Next time you're in Tampa, we'll go out. So he gives me his card and stuff. And it was all because, you know, you got to be larger in life, right? I just happened to tell a guy I'd rather die than send my kids to U University of Georgia. And the guy sitting next to me has donated so much money to Georgia Tech, they're putting on like an entire ball in his honor. That night, I'm like, boom, jackpot, right? So now, if my, kid, if my engineering kid can't get into MIT, I know somebody at Georgia Tech, not only did I teach at Georgia Tech and sit on a board at Georgia Tech. Now I know one of the most powerful alumni <laughs> at the university. I'm like, boom, yeah. But uh, yeah, Georgia Matt's right. You got to be careful because I, I, can, I, can, I can get unlucky and <laughs> right, I can get unlucky and get myself into trouble. There's a lot of Georgia fans in Georgia. No, well, they're the best football team on the planet, right? So anyways, got to go, babe. It was real, but I got to jump. So again, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May our profits be above average. Uh, cheers. Yeah, and I'll be over on uh, YouTube in a minute. Cheers.